do you have one word of love for Mother Earth? Uh, father, son. And why father, son? If there wasn't father, son, there wouldn't be Mother Earth. <laughs> and what is, uh, how can we love the Earth? To love the earth is very natural. The other animal species, they love the earth. They understand their relationship with the earth. For instance, when an animal is uh, sick, it knows what herbs to, to eat. It doesn't need to go to the doctor and the birds know the direction to migrate they know these things instinctively so as human species we need to become maybe more instinctive more intuitive to be in tune with the earth and then we will know more what the earth can give us and what we can give the earth in return and what the earth can't give us. So Thay has said that the earth is uh, not just matter, Mother Earth is also spirit and we should relate to her as, as spirit. And we living beings, we also have both matter and spirit. So we are of the same substance as, as the earth. So it's only natural that we should uh, love the earth. Although maybe we've forgotten how to do that. And we need to learn, allow ourselves to learn again. And that will bring us much joy. And where on our path, on our way, did we lose that we forget to love the earth? That I don't know. I'm not an anthropologist. So I, I don't really know. But I think our brain has uh, developed in a certain way. And uh, maybe that is a little bit of the obstacle for our being able to love the earth and being able to love each other. So our brain is plastic and we can retrain our brain to, to be different but it takes a training and so that is why, why we take up a practice, a spiritual practice why we become a monk or a nun to, to train our brain and we begin by training in mindfulness to make life meaningful to enjoy everything we do, to be aware of what we are doing as we do it, so we do less harmful things for the earth. And above all, to walk, to walk on the earth, to walk mindfully on the earth, to feel the earth under our feet as we walk, to feel the air and the atmosphere around us as we walk, nourishes us, it also nourishes the earth because every step we take like that it, um, it kisses the earth it, it um, massages the earth But we are with 8 billion people on this planet mm -hmm. so how can we reach out to 8 billion people to to train their brain, their mind, and to come back to the earth. Yeah. We need a collective awakening. And we have to educate people, to let them know what's gone wrong, to recognize what's gone wrong, and then they'll have the motivation to to want to do differently. But in fact we can 
get a lot of happiness from, from practicing mindfulness. So it's not something difficult or it is changing our habits. And how to reach eight billion people? That is a question I cannot, I cannot answer. But I know that my own consciousness is part of the collective consciousness. So I, I have to really do the best and share with whoever is ready to, to hear. Thank you for your practice and for your sharing, which you do a lot. So you said we have to love the earth. But what is the root cause of the climate crisis? You know, the Buddha said that nothing has just one cause. Everything has the multiple causes. But all I can say is that uh, the root cause is not necessarily something material. It's maybe it's in the realm of our mental formations. Like we talk about the three poisons of craving and hatred and ignorance. And uh, maybe these three poisons, they are, they are the core, part of the, an important part of the course of the degradation of our, our climate. Because we have, um, our greed, we have taken more from the earth than she can, she can give us. And our ignorance uh, doesn't let us see how we can take care of the earth. And our hatred for one another, uh, other, other humans, has meant that we, uh, we use our resources, we use the resources of the earth to do uh, harmful things. Like we, we make ourselves rich, make our country rich in order to produce armaments and to, to kill each other. So these three poisons, they, they pollute our mind, but they also may be the root of, of polluting the earth. So what happens inside what happens? Will, will be projected outside? Yeah, yeah. Or will manifest outside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You already touched upon it. In which way the practice of mindfulness mm. can be important in, in the process mm. of healing? Yeah. We have what are called the five mindfulness trainings. And uh, these are ways to train our mind in an ethical way. And they are part of what we call global global ethics. That is, they really belong to every spiritual tradition. And so we try very hard to reach a, a larger audience than just people who want to practice uh, in a Buddhist monastery. And in uh, 2000, uh, they produced what was called the Mani produced what was called the manifesto for the uh, for the UN to put on the, uh, to put out, and millions of people signed it. And the basis was the five mindfulness trainings, what we vow to do, what we are determined to do, to the best of our ability. So the first mindfulness training is called reverence for life, protecting life, how we can protect life. And of course we can do this by trying very hard not to kill uh, living beings. But we also learn from that mindfulness training that dogmatism and fanaticism uh, 
that lie deep in our consciousness are also responsible for for not protecting life. So we have to let go of ideologies and dogma, uh, even Buddhist ones, we have to let go of them so that they don't become a, a source of contention, a source of, of aggression towards others who have different ideologies from us. And the second uh, mindfulness training is about looking for happiness in the right place because we look for happiness in the future. We look for happiness in consuming. And the right place to look for happiness is in the here and now with what we already have, not with what we, we want to get or we want to, to consume more. So we learn that we have more than enough conditions for happiness right now. And that is a wonderful way to take care of the earth because we don't overconsume. And the other thing is we recognize that Mother Earth is still something very wonderful, very beautiful, that can nourish us every day. So we don't drown in despair about what's going to happen in the future. But we learn to appreciate what we, we have in the present moment. We have two eyes to enjoy the blue sky. We have two ears to hear the birds singing. We have a nose to smell the, the earth after the rain. A tongue to taste the herbs that come from it and so on. And those, these things are very uh, precious. And if we can learn to be content with what we already have, then that is a great benefit for, for the earth. And then the uh, third uh, mindfulness training is about um, mm, true love is called true love. The word love, it's really lost a lot of its, its meaning, a lot of its power. And uh, some people, they, when they want to write about love, and they will put capital letters, L, capital L-O-V-E, to mean, I don't mean the kind of love that people usually talk about. I don't mean I love hamburgers or I love going to the cinema. But love uh, contains things like respect, uh, patience, understanding. Without those things it's not, it's not love with capital letters. So we, in the third mindfulness training we vow to, to practice that kind of love. And uh, if we fall in love with somebody, we want to turn that love into something that contains respect, that contains understanding and patience. And those are the true marks of true love. So as far as loving the earth is concerned, it means I understand the earth to a certain extent, as or I'm learning, I'm training to understand the earth. Um, I'm patient with the earth. Sometimes the earth needs to express her, her pain. And she may do that in terms of uh, natural disasters. But uh, we understand that those natural disasters have their, their root causes and maybe the human way of relating to the earth is, is one of those causes. Earthquakes, tsunamis and things like that. But uh, we learn to be patient with the earth and we learn to respect the earth and to respect all, all the earth's children. Because when we talk about the earth we're really talking about her children as well. We're talking about the trees and the, the things that grow on the earth. And, and the grass that covers the earth. And then uh, the fourth uh, the fourth training is uh, 
loving speech and deep listening. This is something that, as a human species, we talk. That is our way of communication. The bees communicate by doing dance. The ants communicate with formic acid, I think, or something else. And we humans, we communicate with language. And so it's very necessary for us to learn how to communicate. And part of, a very important part of communication is, is deep listening. If we want to talk lovingly, we need first to listen deeply. And there are many people who really need to be listened to. Other people, other children of the earth. And if we are going to be skillful in educating people about the situation of the environment, we have to use loving speech. We have to use a speech that understands the people that we are talking to, is able to listen to the people we are, we are talking to. And uh, to be able to listen deeply is one of the skills, one of the most beautiful skills that a human being can learn. It means to, to empty your, yourself in order to be able to receive what you hear from the other person without any reaction, without any judgment. And uh, it's also a real training. It takes time. And the fifth mindfulness training is about mindful consumption. That is so important for the earth and so important for us. If you think about Christmas time, how much do we consume unnecessarily? And even our own human species, there are those who, who cannot consume like, like we do. There are those who live in abject poverty. And we can Continue, we can continue to consume in a way that makes others poor, that deprives others. For instance, around here we grow a lot of grapes to make wine. And that earth we could use to grow food. And then we, we use a lot of pasture for cattle to kill for, for beef. This is uh, really dangerous for Mother Earth because the elevation of livestock causes a lot of methane gas, which contributes enormously to climate degradation and People say that it's more important to, to stop eating meat than it is to drive your car. To, that means that uh, eating meat causes more climate degradation than driving a car. Though, of course, if you can stop both, it's, it's wonderful. <coughs> So, obviously, manufacturers who make things, they want us to buy them. So, advertising is also something that causes a lot of, a lot of harm. Making people buy what they don't need. Making people think that they need things that they don't need. That is not a very honest way to, to earn one's livelihood. And we don't have to become vegan straight away. We can allow ourselves to become vegan slowly. Even if we can give up eating meat uh, 
once a week, one day a week, it already makes a difference. And we may find we enjoy that day so much that we want to have other days when we don't eat meat. So those are the five uh, mindfulness trainings that we practice. And they are not uh, something secular, uh, not something uh, belong to Buddhism, sectarian. They don't belong to Buddhism alone. You can find them in every spiritual tradition. And how do you express your love for Mother Earth? I suppose by enjoying Mother Earth. Enjoying the beauty. Enjoying the other, the other species. And in loving other species. In, in, we also love the, love the earth every day to be able to to walk on this planet earth and to feel nourished by walking on the planet earth so I suppose walking is my way and when I walk I want to arrive, arrive in the present moment, feel that I'm ho at home, that Mother Earth is my home. Sometimes we have the tendency to think that there's better places than the Earth. Maybe when I die, I will go to the Kingdom of God or to the Pure Land. It will be better than the Earth. But when we live it deeply in the present moment, when we walk and really arrive in every step, we realize that this is the most beautiful place. There can't be anywhere more beautiful than this. So, Thay has said the pure land is, uh, the kingdom of God or the pure land is now or, or never. Because I may have idea that there is and I think we all, many of us do have that idea that there is somewhere else, a different place or a place in the future which will be better than what we have now. And that could also be a root cause of our destructive attitude toward the earth, our lack of respect towards the earth not really appreciating the earth enough and thinking always, oh, they're somewhere better than this. But with the practice of walking meditation, when you really can dwell in the present moment as you walk, when each step can take you back to the here and the now, walking in that way you recognize that this is the most beautiful place. And uh, in uh, Buddhism, they teach that the pure land is, is the consciousness, is the mind. The pure land comes from our consciousness. And so, it's the way we look at the earth. The way we are aware of the earth that produces the pure land. Or produces something we consider not to be, to be not good enough the idea we need something better. I didn't realize I had that until one day I was practicing walking meditation and I suddenly realized, oh, all these years I've been thinking there's somewhere better than the earth. <laughs> and indeed when the uh, astronomers go up and look down and see that blue-green uh, planet in, in in space, in the darkness of space. They say, oh my goodness, that's home. Yeah, sometimes they have to go off the earth in order to recognize that earth is home. <laughs> so wherever you are, you are home, whether you are in France or in England or, 
Africa, your home. Opening the mind and see the wonders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you already answered, but what is the most important teaching you receive from Thai related to the earth? Mm. I think I may have I may have answered that. The earth is spirit, not just matter. The kingdom of God is now or never. These are very important teachings for me. And I think they are linked to something that Thai has transmitted. And that is to go into the ultimate dimension. You need to go deeply into the historical dimension. That is the historical and the ultimate dimension are not two separate things apart from each other. But by living deeply each moment of, of daily life, you can touch the transcendent, you can touch the ultimate. And there's no other way. So that our practice is, is never something divorced from life, divorced from the everyday. But using the everyday, enjoying the everyday in order to enjoy the, the ultimate. And the other part is that the ultimate is not far away. It's not something that we need 20 years to be able to touch. We can touch, it's always available if we are available to, to it. So this kind of relationship between the ultimate and the historical is something, a very precious teaching that I have received from Thai. You grew up yourself in the south of England, near the sea. I've read your autobiography, very beautiful how you describe your childhood. You were young and innocent. The world was big and beautiful. Nowadays, young people grow up with the knowledge that their earth is in danger and that a lot of species are dying out. What would you tell to your young self of 10 years old or 8 years old, a girl or a boy, the young children of of the future in, yeah, I call it losing their innocence because they are faced with such a big story, a big reality, a big challenge. What would you tell, say to them? So these people are my grand nieces, my grand nephew. <laughs> yeah. And I think they they know that, they suffer because of that. I want to tell them that everything you think, you say and you do has an impact. Don't think that you are powerless. You can do little things and they, like throwing a little stone into a lake, the ripples will go out. Everything you think it doesn't stay in your head. It has an effect on, on consciousness, on life. Everything you say, everything you do. Enjoy what you can of the earth. Enjoy nature. Learn about nature. Put yourself in nature. Do things to take care of nature. Plant trees. I 
And it's true that one day the human species will will become extinct. Nothing is permanent. But maybe out of the human species some other species will evolve. Just like the human species evolved out of other species. Other species can evolve out of human species. And if we want the human species to evolve into another species beautifully, then we need to think beautifully, uh, speak beautifully, and act beautifully now. And all those uh, little actions will help a beautiful species to, to evolve even though we no longer can say it's the human species. And we need to do it together. We have to drop what was called individualism, what belonged to the the first part of this century and the last century. Wanting individual happiness. We see that our happiness is collective happiness. If you're not happy, I can't be happy. So our aim is collective happiness. And our aim is to do things together Because when we come together and do things together, the uh, energy that we produce and the energy that we receive is, is, uh, is, is multiplied. So a hundred people coming together wanting to take care of the earth uh, produces an energy which could be a thousandfold. So we need to find people who, who are like us, who want to act beautifully, think beautifully and speak beautifully and come together to support each other in doing that. We cannot do it alone. I, in an interview, said some years ago, Mother Earth wants us to be enlightened, to become enlightened. Yeah, yeah, what yeah, does he mean by that? Yeah. We become enlightened and every day we can become enlightened. We can have little enlightenments. I suppose it's the opposite of ignorance. Enlightened means that the Mother Earth needs us to see things as they are. And seeing things as they are, it's not a theory. It's not metaphysics. Because the world is in a state of, ch everything is changing at every minute. So we can have little enlightenments at any moment to see how this particular thing I'm enlightened about is. And enlightenment is always enlightenment about something. It's not some abstract thing out there. So today I can be enlightened about my sister or about my uh, brother's suffering and that will help me to relate differently to them. I can be enlightened about the earth, uh, the earth's suffering and that will cause me to relate differently. If I get an enlightenment about how wonderful is a fresh clean water so many people, they don't have any clean water at hand. And I just have to turn the tap on. 
and I see water as something infinitely precious and I don't want to waste water anymore. And I want every time I use water to, for the gratitude in me to, to flow. And therefore I have an enlightenment about, about water, my relationship to water. And this causes me to use water differently. So all of us need these little enlightenments every day. And they're only made possible when we practice mindfulness. Mindfulness means just doing the thing you are doing now, being present now and not wandering off into the future and always thinking, what am I going to do next after I finish doing this? But just to do what you're doing now and stay with that in the here and the now. Is there something in your heart that you want to say at that we didn't touch upon? As a Zen, Zen master asked that, you have to say it straight away. You can't, <laughs> if you delay, it's too late. So it's too late. <laughs> I delay. <laughs> Thank you, dear sister, for being here and now with me and with dear. I know you're there. I'm very happy. Beautiful. So